Hi, I'm Ash. Um, we've had kind of a bit of a winding road to get here. So, because uh, we met Fred in Leeds um, when he was working over there and living over in Leeds as well. And we set up a, a conference called the Leeds Testing Atelier. Um, so with, I think there was, was seven of us, and so quite a big group setting up this conference, and, and Fred was a member. So we got to know Fred really, really well. And then, then uh, I think, was it last month, um, a bunch of people from Know It were at Nordic Testing Days, where Gwen was speaking, and I was doing a, um, doing a tutorial. So, and funnily enough, we were coming on holiday to Oslo. So this is how we holiday. <laughs> we come and speak to groups of people about testing. So, you know, it's not everybody's idea of a holiday, but we kind of enjoy it. So, um, you can get me on Twitter at Northern Tester. I do have a blog as well, so testing is believing. So if you fancy reading some of my longer stuff, it's on there. So, I want to talk about... Uh, who's heard of the shift-left movement? Or the shift-right? So, essentially, um, we're discussing... So the tester's role and where it sits in kind of like, you know, since we've been going through agile transformations, now latterly, uh, like DevOps transformations, trying to bring DevOps closer together. So it's like, where does the tester sit in all that? So this is kind of my contribution to that, to that debate. Hmm. Where do I need to stand? Oh, here. So... So how, where should testers go? Should they shift leftwards towards, say, design and development, get involved earlier and earlier and earlier in that process? Yeah? Less towards the right-hand side of the board, if you visualise like a Kanban board. Yeah? So you know, where do you sit? That's kind of like one of the ways that I like to describe it. Where, you know, where do you do most of your work? Where is your heat map on your team's board? So is it more towards the left, where you talk about what types of testing would be useful for a story or a feature or however you describe that? Is it more towards that side? And there's also like shifting right as well. So going beyond sort of off the team, the development team can on board, if you like, and onto a more OPSI uh, sort of operationally focused board, talking about like uh, monitoring, alerting, and you know, um, things that concern production and looking at analytics. So you've kind of got like this, this sort of this, this shift, uh, uh, this, this kind of shift concept, but it's like, where do we shift to? So, or both, you know, is it as simple as you shift left or you shift right and then you stay there? I don't know if it is. But I kind of think that testability um, is a way to get the best out of both of those worlds in a lot of ways. Because, I mean, so for me, testability is the ability to observe, control and understand a system. Yeah? Which sounds pretty useful for pretty much everybody, right? If you said to someone in, say, in operations, um, I'm sure you've all worked with like exasperated DBAs and sysadmins and various other people who are just like, well, what is this you put into production? How do we deploy it? You know, how do we operate it? How do we monitor it? And if you say, well, we built this so you can observe it, control it, and understand it, I think you'd be able to get them on board with what you were doing. That sounds pretty cool. And I, don't th I think they're probably used to not having that level of uh, control and observability on software that's often put in production. Sometimes you have, you know, a, quite a big, uh, it depends on your process, but say if you've got like, you might do a load of development and then a load of like operational readiness and then put it into production. So sometimes that gap can create a dissonance between, dev, uh, between dev and ops. But I think a testability focus focused on those three key components of observability, controllability, and understandability can really sort of, uh, can really bring teams together and could be a compelling new role for a tester. So, has anyone seen this before? I know Gwen's seen it before because you've seen this talk before. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, a lady called uh, Cindy uh, Sarutaran, um, very, very smart, awesome testing blog. She's not a tester, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, so, uh, very, very smart. She talks about um, like all the different forms of testing that you can do, either pre-production or in production itself. Is anybody kind of dabbling with any sort of testing in production type? Um, 
I mean, it depends what you describe as testing in production, because there's constantly testing going on in production, yeah, because people are always doing stuff with it. Just depends what kind of stuff. Um, but so, I mean, Cindy's got like an excellent sort of coverage of all the different types of testing you can do. So, you know, your shift left, your left, your left-sided tester, maybe you know, as more as things currently are for a lot of testers, you might work more in the pre-production realm, yeah, and then. Part, a part in the deployment bit and a bit of release and then the odd thing where you look into what's happened in production to the things that you've tested. I don't know about you, but like early, certainly earlier in my career, um, I would build stuff and then it would go into production and I would never hear of it again. And it, I remember once I, uh, I actually went and checked on something that, that we'd built to see how it was doing and it was like an operational nightmare and made no money and we'd spent like a year on it. So it's like, well... You know, in terms of shifting sort of rightwards and finding out about how you know the the stuff that you've tested is actually doing in production, there was quite a big lesson in there. Um, so, I think a more right-sided, uh, you know, a more shift right sort of um, profile might look a bit more like this. I've kind of arbitrarily picked out some. So you still, so again, I don't think it's as simple as saying well. You, you're definitely, you know, on the right-hand side of that's it. Yeah, that's where you live. Because you're bound to do some stuff on the left as well. Because in theory, if, if you're an expert in terms of uh, uh, knowing what the analytics and the quality of production looks like, then you'd be really useful here as well, yeah, to talk to development teams about how that works, about what that, that quality profile is. So in terms of testability, it's kind of all those things. It sits across the top of them. Because essentially, those things talk about uh, observability, controllability, and understanding something. So why can't testability sit across the top of the lot? If you as a tester can focus on testability, then maybe uh, you can be more effective in your role. So, so testability concerns, I guess the simplest when you boil the definition down into something that's, um, how easy is something to test? Who here works on things where you need loads of data set up and you need to email someone to do this and email someone to do that and send a Slack message to another person to do something else? And then after two days of asking, you can then finally run this test that you needed to run. Yeah, it's pretty common. I went in, in the tutorial at, at Nordic Testing Days. I've got some sort of really wild and wacky tales about, you know, about two week long data setups and things like that just to get something into a testable state. So I think there's some work for us to do as testers as well, um, especially uh, maybe in the more sort of in the sort of senior and test manager type roles to think about what to do when something is hard to test. Because you've got a series of sort of common reactions, if you like. So you do more testing if something's hard to test. Yeah, you just do more of it, and more, most of the time it's the testing that testers do, which might not be the most effective way to do this. Yeah, because if something's hard to test, then perhaps you know, uh, if you've got uh, other disciplines involved, developers, etc., they probably know and be able to write interesting tools which would speed things up a little bit. But if you just do more of the testing that testers do, it still remains hard to test. And hire more testers, kind of links really. It's like well, you know, or just place more testers on a team. I'm sure we, have you all worked in like a crunch time where it's like, all right, okay. So this thing needs to get over the line and there's just testing left, which is always a sign that something's hard to test. If you ever hear, oh, well, there's just testing left or, you know, it's only testing. And it's like, well, these things are, are good signs about that there's something like amiss there. And I can see from some smiles around as well that you've probably heard that before. So hiring more testers. Do more automation. So similarly, yeah. If it's hard to test, especially when it's really hard to automate, if you just do loads and loads of automation and keep piling it on, then you, co then you compound the problem. So rather than rewinding a little bit and saying, oh, hey, well, how do we make this easier to test? How can we make it easier to observe or to control? Then we just start writing more automation. And then mocking as well. So who, uh, sort of who works with sort of, sort of difficult third parties? You've got like very little control over them. You know, they're sometimes they're like, uh, the systems are down or they do releases when you're not expecting it. So you just build a mock and say, right, we've mocked it out. 
and let's not think about it again until you get to, I don't know, like a staging or a pre-production or even a production environment, and that's the first time that you properly integrate with them, and then it's all broken because something's changed. So mocking is uh, it's an interesting tool, but you do have to be careful with it. So, but it's not an answer to, your, to something being hard to test. It's just, well, how can we circumvent that difficulty to test? And then fire and forget into production. Um, again, another, another thing that I always hear is like, well, um, you can't test this or you don't need to test this. Is another, like, those, those, those statements that you often hear. And it's like, well, they always make me think, well, that's interesting, isn't it? So I can't test this. So have, we've not done anything. Like, no, 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 we've upgraded from, like, PHP 5 to PHP 7. It's like, yeah, I think we should test that. Or we should at least have a look in some way or another. So it's like, when you hear that, it's like, well, you know, should we just, like, fire and forget it into production and see what happens? So these are all interesting signs for me, like, when you hear about things that are hard to test. So think testability. So observe. So the ability to know what's going on, especially when it's like, well, say if you trigger your system from, you know, trigger some system action in terms of testing, and then how do you know what's happening elsewhere as well? Complexity, all our systems are now complex. We've gone way beyond the complicated into the complex. So it's like, well, how do you know what's happening when you trigger something, when you trigger a particular condition in your system? So you need to be able to observe it. So logging, monitoring, alerting um, in, in, your in all your environments. Control. So if you can't control the system and set it into the state that you need it to be, how effective can your testing be? If you can't like, set the data that you need in order to, to you know, sort of accurately uh, execute a particular scenario, then you're not in really in that much control of what you're doing. So I don't think your testing can be that effective. So if you have ways and means of controlling it, then uh, your testing will be much more effective and then understanding as well. This is the softer side of testability, talking to people about you know, what they've built. You know, asking a developer to say, oh, hey, you, you finished this part of this story. Well, come and tell me what you've done. Show me what you've done. Yeah? Explain it to me. Those kind of softer sides. So trying to you know, transfer a bit of knowledge um, in a much more collaborative way. So for me, if it's testable, it's supportable. So if it's testable it, while you're working in a development team, say, then well, as soon as it goes into the operations, as soon as it becomes, uh, goes into the operations realm, then it's going to be much more supportable. So much more observable, controllable, and understandable. And useful to all, not just DevOps. So it wouldn't be a testing presentation without a bit of James back in there. Um, so this is kind of like the, um, the initial sort of, uh, this is probably the base model for testability that um, most, most testers might know about or most testers might be able to reason around. And this is very, uh, very holistic. Um, so you've got, most of the stuff that I talk about tends to be like the uh, sort of intrinsic testability. Yeah? So you might change the product itself to make it more testable. Add some logging, for example. Yeah? Add some... Uh, you know, uh, so add some extra logging, which you know uh, indicates when a third party has been called. So you log that into your own system, so you can see the full path of uh, of whatever the request was. Um, and then subjective, so you learn something new. So that changes the way that you test, makes something more testable. You know, if you're if you're working on a Angular app and you start learning Angular, then you'll probably be able to test it in more novel ways and more interesting ways. Maybe not, but it certainly changes the testability of it. Project related, so uh, the conditions of the project that you're on. You know, what's it like? Is it tight for time? Is it, uh, like I said, are you trying to replace a, you know, an application that's existed for five years and someone says, well, you know, just, we, just, we just need a new version of that. Can you just copy it? And you say, well, maybe. Um, so what are the conditions of the project? And then epistemic as well. So it's kind of like the gap between what you know and what you need to know. Yeah. So if someone says, well, this, this, uh, you know, this system needs to respond uh, maximum of four seconds response time you know, from, a, from an individual call to it. 
and then you don't know anything about it. So the gap is quite large there, so you need to start to build uh, tests in to build that. Um, and then value related. So if you change the quality standard, if someone says, well, you know, we just need to get this out tomorrow. You can just say, right, okay, well, I've, I've tested this, I haven't tested this, and these are the risks that still remain, and they say, fine, that's changing the testability of it, yeah? Because you've changed the value that you need to get out of the system. So, kind of the meat of this is about what I call faffing with features. So, is faffing a very British thing to say, Fred? Yeah. Right, okay. So, like messing around with features while there's uh, much more pressing things that could you probably use a tester's attention. So, so what, what, do we mostly work on, say, development teams working on like new features, new functionality for customers? Or do we do like operational stuff? How, do, how are we? Is it usually that kind of work? Yeah? Yeah, a bit of both. But essentially, this was kind of like um, the question that's always in my head is where's the biggest gain to be made in the system? Yeah? So I think focusing on testability can help you determine where the biggest gain is. And by the system, I mean the whole thing. Like the system itself, how you work on it, who's working on it. So this is very much the systems thinking question. But it's like, well, you know, we can run some tests and we can get, you know, feature X out of the door. But does it really help in terms of our overall flow and throughput for like the whole the whole project or the whole product? So disclaimer, I'm not saying there's no value in testing features, because of course there is. But and testers testing features finds important problems, of course it does, you know? and adds a lot to those teams. But I'm just like, well, is it the most important thing? Is it the, you know, is it, does it deserve the whole focus? So we're going to talk about two metrics, two examples. So the time taken to start testing, um, which is, all, for me, is always like an interesting uh, testability metric. So if it takes you, if, if a developer says, right, we've, you know, we've, we've built this environment, and then if it takes you then two days to get that build up and running, before you can start to test it, the time taken to testing is too long. Uh, and I think it affects the quality of the testing. And then uh, extended and or unplanned downtime. Yeah. So it's like, well, I think if you have a lot of this, then maybe you're not testing in the right areas or thinking about testability enough. So time to testing. So a little while ago, I was testing a mobile app um, it was a hybrid app, so it was uh, uh, like a mobile website within an app container with some fairly basic native components. Um, so not, nothing too complex. We had a local dev environment, so we could literally pull down uh, you know, uh, a branch that a developer had been working on and start testing it as early as we liked. So that was pretty cool. Um, so in order to get the local dev environment onto the device that you wanted to test it on, you needed to change certain things, like the DNS entry, for example. So you had your own dev environment with an address, and then you needed to change the DNS in order to get it onto, uh, onto that mobile device. Problem is the DNS was set, the TTL was like something ridiculous, like hours and hours and hours. So it just wouldn't happen quick enough. So, uh, so between like, the incredibly rapid part of being able to say, right, a developer's finished on a branch, and you being able to start testing it to get it on a device, you had this big chunk of like time between feedback. So there's time to start testing. Yeah. You could test it locally on the, you know, on your device on your on your on your machine, but still it wasn't quite the same as getting it on a device. So testing was always lagging behind. So you always saw sort of big lists of things waiting to test. And everyone was exhausted by the time they got to testing because essentially you'd have to wrestle with a bunch of devices, uh, update the DNS, go and then, like, uh, when it didn't work, go and poke someone. And if they weren't there, go and try and find someone else to poke about it. And it was like, well, I think in the end, the quality of the testing actually suffered and important problems were missed. And there was a bit of that sort of fire and forget into production. It's like, well, we haven't seen it on device yet, but, you know, we can't wait for it because it needs to go out sort of now. It's like, oh, right, okay, so let's put it in production. 
So instead of testing it harder or more or you know, any of the other sort of patterns that we saw before, I thought, right, OK, let's approach this slightly differently. So how can we make this a little bit better? So we did three things. So we took our testability model of being able to observe, control, and understand something. And I thought, how can we make this a bit better? So observation-wise, so into our, into our development build of the app, we added uh, like a pull-up menu, which just had information in it. So the build number, which feature flags were enabled on that build, uh, which trials a particular customer in well, once you'd signed in, um, and then just sort of showed you the operating system, the browser, and a couple of key sort of session cookies. So you could really see what was happening with the app. Yeah. Really great for, you know, if you find a problem, you can just, you can just sort of show it to the developer and say, well, hey, brilliant. You know, this is how it's configured. So these were just all the questions that you got asked when you found a problem, basically. Yeah. So let's just make them obvious. And then controlling as well. So previously, uh, we had like a feature flag controller. Has anybody used feature flags here to, to sort of hide, hide or show functionality in, in different environments? So essentially, you can you, you can basically hide a new feature behind a feature like behind like a toggle, and then once it's ready to be consumed, then you can turn it on to to the world or just to yourself. Um, but there was a really awkward way of doing that. So we set that uh, within the app, not without. So basically, we. Uh, we had the ability to set whatever feature flags we wanted, um, but while you were on the device rather than beforehand. And then we just lowered the DNS uh, time to load because it just made sense rather than having it hours and hours and hours and actually put it on a decent, a decent box and a decent machine and made it a bit more responsive and got someone looking after it, put it under you know, a, a team's overall uh, remit. And then understanding... Uh, we worked on the feature flag naming convention as well because people were making me cry with the, how they named them. Um, there was one called enable, disregard, disable, dot enabled, or something like that. And I was just like, right, okay, you lot, enough. Let's do this sensibly. Um, and then we got um, everybody pairing with the native mobile devs as well because we had web devs and native mobile devs. I was like, well, actually, we kind of did some cross, cross pairing on that because it made total sense, and lots of interesting things came out of it, especially with the iOS tool chain as well, because it's quite closed. Um, so Android is uh, just open source, so you can do pretty much what you want with it. Yeah. Someone will have attempted the thing you probably want to do at some point. But with iOS, much more closed. You need accounts. Um, and we got a lot of understanding about what accounts were needed, the developer accounts, and like what the global accounts meant, and how to get something through the App Store. So much more understanding. And we got branch to device in minutes. So we turned that from hours into minutes just by making like a few simple changes. I don't think we did anything like particularly like, you know, amazing. Just brought, brought people together a bit more. Um, added, it just exposed some information that was already there in a handy way and changed the amount of time it took to actually to update the DNS. And the beautiful thing about this is, is that it enabled developers to test on real devices. And this is kind of like one of the key things with testability, right? Is that I often hear testers saying, right, we need to, you know, everybody needs to be testing. Quality is everybody's responsibility. It's like, right, okay, yeah, fair enough. I understand all those platitudes, but how do you actually make that happen? So you have to make it as easy as possible for a developer to test something. And then I've seen no evidence that they won't do it. Yeah? And we went from a culture where we had uh, mobile devices locked in cabinets and getting lost all the time and you know, post-it notes denoting who had signed it out, um, which got lost and got stuck to someone's shoe and then got trailed outside the building and then someone said the next day, where's the, you know, where's the Galaxy S6? It's like, well, I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, so we changed that and people were sat uh, developing with devices next to their desks and plugged into their computers and got constantly with their environment, with our local dev environment, um, with the latest changes in there, which was really cool. So that's the real win with a lot of this, is that you make it easier to test, people will test. <laughs> yeah? If you continue to build things that are really hard to test, then they won't. 
So the second one was about costly downtime. And this is more, this kind of like more speaks to like the faffing with features, messing with features thing. So uh, same company, they had an infrastructure tribe which adopted the Spotify model, which I'm sure you're all aware of slash sick of hearing about. Um, so they had this tribe looking after all the infrastructure, lots of shared services. It was an absolute disaster. So they were constantly having planned and unplanned downtime. And even when it was planned, it'd be like, oh, well, actually, uh, you know, we said this was going to take an hour. It's probably going to take six. It's like, ah, right, OK, fair enough. So they came to me and said, Ash, can you help us with this? And they said, well, and they were like, well, we should hire some testers. And we should build like more copies of production. And this was the environment was very much a uh, it was physical uh, physical hardware. There was a bit of cloud. It's very very mixed, sprawling architecture. So this was just like you know you were talking like a couple of million down the down the drain to build some of these environments out, new data centers. And I'm like, I don't think anyone will go for that. I can't remember a time in my career where someone said, you know, I've said, can I have two million quid for this? And they've said, yeah. <laughs> if the answer is more likely. No. And also, this is my favorite bit about them, was that they loved a Big Bang release. They actually called one of their projects, Project Big Bang. And I said, right, I'm going to walk out of this door, and I'm going to come back in when you're taking this seriously. <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean? It's like, you guys don't even do irony, do you? Um, so all this downtime is happening. And there was loads of testers and lots of focus on, you know, testing features. But the reality was that infrastructure problems were um, greater than the feature problems. Feature problems were sort of fairly trivial, really, uh, compared to the amount of downtime and cost. So, you know, we had the, the ability to roll back a feature problem within a minute. Uh, and then, but these were costing 250 grand an hour for all this downtime, and it's like, well, are we re really, really testing where the real problem is? So, again, took, went at it from a testability point of view. So, talked about, um, and this was like even simpler than the other one, so it was a, literally a sharing <laughs> exercise. So, with the observability question, uh, we kind of looked at various dashboards that Infra had, and various dashboards that the application teams had, and said, well, you know, this information is most meaningful in context. If you, have, if you don't mix your application and uh, diagnostic information, then it doesn't really mean all that much. Because yeah? it's just like, oh, you know, CPU's you know, at 90% on you know, half, you know, half the instances. Okay? But what's happening in the application to make that happen? Yeah? So we kind of shared a bit, and in our Grafana instances, added some, we had like uh, you can add like events in Grafana where it says, you know, something's happened. Like uh, it was a gambling company, so a, a race has gone off or something like that. And you could see, and if something started to happen, or the number of logins per second, and then you could match that against diagnostic information. So if CPU is suddenly this, uh, you know, suddenly 90% um, on average, and the number of logins is is spiking, you've got context for it. And then we're like, oh yeah, that's interesting. We know who to call now. Um, and then just gave them access to our application uh, monitoring. Um, so we used feature flags for upgrade rollouts as well. No more Big Bang related problems. So you know, if we needed to uh, to uh, upgrade a particular dependency, we would then put that behind a feature flag, um, or at least roll it out to a certain number of hosts and monitor it. Um, and then instead of giving them uh, a big a, a, like a new production-like environment, we just said, well, here's our dev environment, here's how easy it is to build, because it was just a containerized solution. So it's like, oh, and they said, oh, okay, well, we can do small, trivial things on here. And then the biggest one for, for infra, for infrastructure, was pairing on application development. And then, as usual, we targeted networking for knowledge sharing, because essentially, you know, networking is, uh, is usually one of the, the more complex areas where you've got you know, people who've been there for ages um, who know like, every little bit of uh, uh, complexity in the network setup. So as a result, much more empathy between the teams and a lot lower unplanned and extended downtime. 
So in conclusion, so testers often talk about staying relevant. I think it's important to, to think about how we're going to do this going forward and what different routes we can take. I don't think there's one route. I think some testers might be able to go and you know, make a great career for themselves in terms of looking at production as, a, um, you know, as, as an oracle and spreading that information. I've seen plenty of, of, uh, of instances of that. But then others might say, well, let's have a testability focus and try and you know, make things easier to test rather than just sort of you know, being on the old treadmill and just testing, trying to test things that are hard to test and trying to test them harder or more or write more automation or any of the other anti-patterns I mentioned. So to finish, the three ways of DevOps. So I think this all ties quite nicely. Nice, uh, you shift left. Um, towards design and uh, product, or you shift right, more towards production. So I think it describes that quite nicely. Amplifying feedback as a tester, yeah, that's part of your role. The ability to experiment and learn. So you learn from knowing more about your production environment and what's happening. And then systems thinking. Is this the most important thing that I can test? Or the most, the most important place that I can focus? Sometimes it's organisational barriers to focusing in different areas. If you suddenly go and start, like you know, looking around in you know your infrastructure team's closet, and you're just like, "Oh, what are you looking at?" Oh, well, there's some interesting things in here. People do get upset, so you know, you might wish to say something before you start doing things like that. I didn't. Um, so, hang on, isn't that testability? Observability of system feedback. So being able to control the system state in order to experiment, yeah? because when you run an experiment, you need a you need a mech you need like a control uh, a control group, yeah? and then you know your main group, and then well, however many groups you have, and then understand the whole system and optimize it globally, rather than thinking, well, you know, I could fix this this little twiddly thing here, and it'll keep you occupied for a couple of days, while there's this whole you know flaming room over here which I've closed the door on, yeah. And that's it. Thank you very much.